Robert Mounts addresses the authorship of the Epistle to the Romans with a clear stance that the Apostle Paul is the authentic author, as traditionally accepted and supported by the letter's self-identification and the consistency in style and language with Paul's other recognized writings. Romans begins by identifying its author as Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. 1. 1. A statement reflecting Paul's known role and mission as an apostle and aligning with accounts of his conversion and ministry found in Acts. The discussion includes an analysis of Tertius's role, mentioned in Romans 16.22, where Tertius identifies himself as the one who wrote down the letter. Mounts delves into the practices of ancient letter writing, particularly the use of an amanuensis, a scribe who wrote letters on behalf of others. He outlines different levels at which an amanuensis might work, from direct transcription to a more creative role in formulating the message. However, Mounts argues that the stylistic and thematic consistency of Romans with Paul's other letters, such as Galatians and 1 and 2 Corinthians, indicates that Paul maintained close oversight of the letter's content, suggesting a more direct transcription role for Tertius rather than a creative one. By examining these aspects, Mounts dismisses the notion that anyone other than Paul could be responsible for the core content of Romans. He concludes with a reference to A.M. Hunter, emphasizing that no one seriously doubts Paul's authorship outside of fringe theories. This consensus is underpinned by the letter's internal and external evidence, aligning with the broader scholarly understanding of Pauline authorship across his epistles. Also, Mounts dives into the debate over the intended recipients of Paul's epistle to the Romans. Some scholars suggest that the absence of the phrase in Rome in several manuscripts indicates it might have been a circular letter meant for various Christian congregations, possibly including Ephesus. However, Mounts favors the traditional view that Romans was indeed addressed to believers in Rome, supported by internal evidence and Paul's expressed intentions to visit the city, implying a direct communication with its Christian community. Mounts dismisses the possibility of Peter founding the Roman church, a claim unsupported by the epistle itself. Paul's own words suggest he had no prior connection to the Roman church's establishment and was keen on not building on another's foundation, further distancing the possibility of Peter's foundational role in Rome. Instead, Mount suggests the Roman Christian community likely formed organically through both Jewish and Gentile believers, possibly influenced by Jews from Rome who converted at Pentecost and other believers who migrated to the city. The expulsion of Jews from Rome under Emperor Claudius, as recounted by Suetonius, is noted for its impact on the church's demographic shift towards a Gentile majority. Despite this, Paul's letter addresses both Jewish and Gentile members, reflecting the mixed composition of the early church. Mounts also identifies distinct groups within the Roman church, including legalists, libertines, and spiritualists, indicating a diverse community grappling with various theological and social issues. He accentuates the personal greetings in Romans 16 as evidence of the church's varied social makeup, with members ranging from long-standing believers to influential individuals. This detailed examination provides a nuanced understanding of the Roman Church's early dynamics and the pivotal role of Paul's letter in its development. Moreover, Mounts' analysis of the date and place of origin of the epistle to the Romans centers on the Apostle Paul's travel itinerary and plans as outlined in Romans 15. Paul, having evangelized extensively in the eastern Mediterranean, expresses his ambition to preach in Spain, considering Rome a crucial stopover. Before these Western missions, he commits to delivering a collection for the poor in Jerusalem, gathered from the churches in Macedonia and Achaia. This context helps situate the letter temporally and geographically within the framework of Paul's third missionary journey. The letter's authorship is strongly attributed to Corinth, or possibly its port, Sencrea, during a three-month stay in Greece after Paul's extensive ministry in Ephesus. Indications within the letter itself such as personal greetings in chapter 16 from Gaius, Erastus, and Phoebe, tie Paul to Corinth and its surroundings. These individuals are linked to Corinth through baptismal records, civic roles, and church service. Determining the exact date of Romans is more complex, involving cross-references between Acts, Pauline epistles, and external historical records like inscriptions and coins. The time frame is narrowed using two anchor points, 
the proconsulship of Gallio and Corinth, AD 51 or 52, and the administrative transition from Felix to Festus in Palestine. Considering these factors, along with Paul's travel and ministry durations, a composition date for Romans is most likely around AD 56. This period allows for the necessary travel and events leading to Paul's subsequent legal troubles in Caesarea, as narrated in Acts. In essence, Mounts' examination places Romans firmly within the historical and socio-political milieu of the mid-first century, reflecting the logistical and missionary strategies of the early Christian movement, particularly through the apostolic work of Paul. The letter's origin from Corinth during a specific and relatively narrow time frame reflects the intricate web of early Christian travel, networking, and theological dissemination. Furthermore, Paul's letter to the Romans is a foundational text, reflecting his strategic vision for spreading the gospel westward to Spain, a task for which he views Rome as a crucial base. At this juncture, Paul has extensively evangelized Asia Minor and the Aegean, and he is preparing to journey further west, aiming to introduce Christ to regions beyond. His immediate plan includes delivering a collection from Macedonian and Achaean believers to the needy in Jerusalem before proceeding to Rome and eventually Spain. In Romans, Paul articulates a detailed exposition of the gospel as he understands it, a move partly prompted by the need to clarify his teachings and rectify misrepresentations spread by his opponents. He affirms justification by faith apart from the law, a point that necessitated delicate handling given the potential implications for the Jewish community's standing and God's covenant with Israel. Paul addresses these concerns, especially in chapters 9, 11, where he seeks to reconcile the apparent paradox of God's righteousness with his dealings with Israel, striving to unite both Jewish and Gentile believers in a common understanding of the gospel. As Paul discusses his travel plans and the challenges ahead, there is a sense of urgency and concern. He solicits prayers for his impending trip to Jerusalem, aware of the dangers and opposition he might face there as forewarned by the Holy Spirit. His apprehension about possible imprisonment and hardship reflects a deep commitment to his mission, asserting the letter's purpose as a comprehensive doctrinal statement. Through this letter, Paul ensures that the essence of his teaching and the scope of his apostolic vision are preserved and communicated to the Roman believers, who he hopes will support and perhaps continue his mission to unreached territories. In addition, Mounts addresses the debate over the original form of the epistle to the Romans, focusing on whether it originally included chapters 15 and 16. The existence of a shorter version, ending at chapter 14, is suggested by evidence from early church practices and manuscript variations. Every known manuscript includes the full text, but variations in early Latin chapter headings, comments by early church fathers like Origen, and the absence of references to the last two chapters by other early Christians hint at a shorter version's circulation. Mounts examines the plausibility of the shorter version being an initial more general letter that Paul later expanded for the Roman church. This hypothesis considers the abrupt ending of Romans at 1423 and the personal nature of early chapters as counterarguments, suggesting that a shorter version would be uncharacteristic of Paul's known letters. Further, the debate includes how and why the shorter version might have originated. Theories range from accidental loss due to the fragility of ancient manuscripts, to deliberate editorial changes by figures like Martian, or even a strategic shortening by Paul himself for broader dissemination. Additionally, Mounts discusses the Chester Beatty Papyrus, P46, which includes Chapter 16, but places the doxology after 1533 hinting at different circulating versions. In discussing the destination of chapter 16, Mounts addresses arguments for an Ephesian destination based on personal greetings and specific mentions like Priscilla and Aquila. However, he ultimately supports the view that chapter 16 was originally intended for the Roman church, contending that the personal greetings, communal aspects, and specific names mentioned align more naturally with a Roman audience. This conclusion, considering the broader context of early Christian text transmission and authority, affirms the integral nature of chapters 15 and 16 in understanding Paul's message to the Romans. Besides, in his thematic overview of Romans, Mounts digs into the context and intentions behind Paul's epistle, written from Corinth or Cancrea during his third missionary journey. 
This letter is not just a routine correspondence. It is a strategic and heartfelt effort to connect with the Roman Christian community. Paul expresses a fervent desire to visit Rome, aiming for mutual encouragement and eager to preach the gospel in the empire's heart. His longing is not only for fellowship, but also to establish Rome as a strategic base for his planned mission to Spain, anticipating that the Roman church might support him as Antioch had previously. The Book of Romans is crafted as a comprehensive theological treatise against the backdrop of Paul's concerns about the misinterpretation and distortion of his teachings, as he experienced with the Galatians. He meticulously presents the gospel, focusing on justification by faith, a doctrine central to Christian theology, positing that righteousness and salvation are gifts from God, accessible through faith in Jesus Christ, not through human merit. This message is critical to Paul. He aims to safeguard it from legalism and antinomianism, ensuring that the core gospel message remains pure and unaltered. Mounts highlights that Romans is a profound exposition of Christian doctrine and practice. The themes selected for discussion in the overview are reflective of Paul's own emphases and are integral to understanding the broader narrative of God's redemptive plan. Paul's systematic approach in Romans lays out the theological and moral implications of the gospel for believers, addressing various aspects of faith and conduct. While the overview does not cover every aspect of Romans, Mounts directs readers to the full commentary for a deeper exploration of its rich theological landscape, indicating the letter's enduring importance in articulating foundational Christian beliefs and ethical living. Additionally, Mounts examines the concept of natural revelation, the understanding that the existence and attributes of God are evident in the created world. He maintains that the Bible presupposes God's existence and points out that atheism is an unnatural state for humanity, which naturally tends toward some form of divine recognition. The crux of Mounts's argument is that, while complete knowledge of God is beyond human reach due to our inherent limitations, there is a clear and reliable understanding of God's eternal power and divine nature evident in the world. Mounts debates that the created universe unmistakably points to a creator endowed with intelligence and personality, inferred from the order and design observed in nature. This revelation is sufficient to hold humanity accountable for acknowledging God's existence and basic attributes. The moral imperative to recognize and respond to this knowledge of God varies across different cultures and historical contexts, but the universal accessibility of God's attributes in nature leaves humanity without excuse for ignorance. Also, Mounts notes that the fullest expression of God's nature and character is in the person of Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate revelation of God. Yet the basis for human accountability to God is not rooted in the complete understanding of His nature as revealed in Christ, but in the rejection or acceptance of the basic knowledge of God evident to all through creation. This foundational awareness of God's power and divinity observable in the world around us, is what renders people without excuse for denying his existence and authority. The implication of Mounts's interpretation is a universal call to recognize the divine hand in the cosmos and respond to the evident truth of God's presence and character. Moreover, Mounts's interpretation of Romans 1 -31 addresses the profound and complex theme of the wrath of God reiterating its role as a response to human rebellion and sinfulness. He disputes that humanity is without excuse for its rebellion, given the innate knowledge of God's existence and character. This knowledge, however, is often suppressed, leading to various forms of ungodliness and wickedness, which in turn invite God's wrath. According to Mounts, God's wrath is not a fierce or vindictive outburst, but rather a sorrowful withdrawal of His presence, allowing humans to experience the natural consequences of their sinful choices. This withdrawal is articulated through the repeated phrase, God gave them over, signifying a divine letting go into the realm of sinful desires and actions. The wrath of God thus manifests not in active destruction, but in a passive allowing of individuals to follow their sinful paths, which leads to moral and spiritual degradation, particularly repeated in the forms of sexual immorality. Mounts makes a point that while wrath and love might seem contradictory, they are in fact complementary aspects of God's nature. God's wrath is essentially his opposition to sin and evil, a stance that is necessary for the maintenance of his holiness and justice. It's a demonstration of his love in its most holistic sense, 
aiming for the restoration and well-being of his creation. By opposing what is harmful and promoting what is good, God's wrath is not just a testament to his justice, but also to his unwavering commitment to righteousness. In sum, Mounts underlines that understanding God's wrath is crucial to understanding his nature as both just and loving. The concept of divine wrath challenges the contemporary understanding of love and justice, inviting a deeper reflection on the moral structure of the universe and the consequences of human freedom and rebellion. Furthermore, in his exposition of Romans 3.21-26, Mounts addresses the pivotal theme of righteousness in Pauline theology, underscoring its nature as a divine gift rather than a human achievement. He clarifies that righteousness in the Pauline context is a status bestowed by God, a radical departure from the prevalent view that righteousness must be earned through moral or religious endeavors. This righteousness is revealed through the gospel and is accessible to all who believe, irrespective of their adherence to the law or cultural background. Mounts explains that this concept of righteousness stands in stark contrast to the human inclination to earn favor with God through various religious practices or moral achievements. He references historical and contemporary religious efforts, emphasizing the universal human tendency to try and merit divine approval. However, Paul accentuates that such attempts are futile. True righteousness is apart from the law and is unattainable through human effort. Delving deeper, Mounts elucidates how this righteousness is imparted to believers. He describes justification as God's act of declaring sinners righteous, a legal declaration that absolves guilt and bestows a right standing before God. This justification is possible through the redemptive work of Christ, whose death paid the ransom for humanity's sins, freeing them from the bondage of sin and death. In addition, Mounts explores the sacrificial metaphor, depicting Christ as the atoning sacrifice, a concept rooted in Jewish sacrificial rituals but fulfilled in Christ's ultimate sacrifice. The commentary affirms the necessity of faith in this process. Righteousness from God is a gift received through faith, a complete reliance on God's grace rather than human merit. Mounts concludes by reiterating the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice, a cornerstone of Christian faith, and the only means to achieve reconciliation with God asserting the transformative power of this understanding in the believer's life. This passage, as interpreted by Mounts, is central to understanding the essence of Christian salvation and the transformative power of the gospel. Further, Mounts's interpretation of Romans 4, 1, 25 highlights Abraham as the exemplar of faith, demonstrating the biblical principle that righteousness is credited not by works, but by faith. Mounts analyzes Paul's argument that justification through faith is a central tenet of Christian belief, using Abraham's story to illustrate this theme. Abraham, known as God's friend, believed God's promise of numerous descendants as numerous as the stars, despite his and Sarah's old age. This belief was credited to him as righteousness, establishing a precedent that faith, rather than adherence to law or ritual, is the path to righteousness. Mounts explains that Paul uses Abraham's story to counter contemporary Jewish beliefs that righteousness stems from the law and circumcision. He indicates that Abraham was declared righteous before his circumcision, implying that the promise of God is accessible to all, Jew and Gentile alike, through faith alone. This redefinition extends the concept of God's chosen people beyond ethnic or ceremonial boundaries, maintaining a universal approach to salvation. Besides, Mounts addresses the nature of Abraham's faith, describing it as confident trust in God's power and promises, rather than blind belief. This faith was not irrational, but based on the understanding that with God, all things are possible, transcending natural laws and human limitations. Abraham's faith serves as a model for believers, illustrating that righteousness through faith is assured and that God's promises, as revealed in the gospel, are accessible to all who believe. Mounts's commentary thus sheds light on the profound implications of Abraham's faith, pointing out its role in understanding justification and righteousness in Christian theology. Additionally, in Mounts's discussion of Romans 5, 1, 11, he explores the subsequent stage of Paul's argument following the concept of justification by faith presented in the preceding chapters. 
Mounts interprets Paul's words as a bridge connecting the foundational theological principle of being made right with God through faith and the resulting implications for the believer's conduct and life. The primary benefit of believing, according to Mounts, is the attainment of peace with God, a concept that transcends mere tranquility. This peace signifies a comprehensive well-being, established when the enmity between humanity and God, sparked by sin, is dissolved through Christ's reconciliatory work on the cross. Beyond peace, believers gain access to God's presence. Mounts compares this to an audience with royalty, where once alienated individuals are welcomed into divine fellowship. This access reverses our innate opposition to God, allowing us close communion after the price for our rebellion has been paid by Christ. The New Testament perception of hope is sharply contrasted with the fragile and illusory hopes found in ancient cultures. Mounts reiterates the robust, God-centered hope that Christianity offers, defining it as a sure and confident expectation grounded in the steadfast character of God. This hope is not simply wishful thinking, but is the assured anticipation of what will undoubtedly transpire, according to divine promises. Paul expands on further benefits of faith, including God's love poured into our hearts, salvation from wrath through Christ's death, and the justification that precedes reconciliation. Mounts repeats that these benefits are not isolated boons, but integral facets of a reconciled relationship with God. At the heart of reconciliation is the personal connection with God, peculiar to the Christian faith. Mounts underlines that believing in Christ necessitates a trust in a living, active person, not merely an intellectual assent to doctrine. As such, believing in Christ paves the way for sinners to be readmitted into God's favor. Reconciliation is effectuated through faith, opening life in continuous companionship with God, where hostility is left in the past. Believers are then able to live in a state of ongoing relationship with God the Father and Jesus Christ, presented as our elder brother. Also, in Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul addresses two fundamental objections that might arise from his teaching on justification by faith. Critics of Paul's message proposed troubling questions underscoring what they saw as dangerous implications of grace-based righteousness. They suggested that if sin leads to increased grace— as Paul indicates when he states, where sin increased, grace increased all the more, Romans 5.20. Perhaps Christians should continue sinning to experience more of God's grace. Paul counters these arguments decisively. He contends that those who have been justified by faith have effectively died to sin. They are united with Christ in his death through baptism. This metaphorical death means that although sin's allure persists, Christians are not helpless against it. The power of sin is broken in the life of a believer, not because sin ceases to be enticing or present, but because through Christ, the believer is no longer under sin's dominion. Dealing with the second objection, Paul maintains that liberation from the law does not equate to an invitation to sin. Detractors suggested that since justification is not based on adhering to the law but through grace, moral conduct is rendered irrelevant. Here, Paul is adamant. By no means. 6.15 he denounces any notion of lawlessness, that being under grace means one can lead a life devoid of moral expectations. In fact, while the law revealed sin, it could not save from it, whereas grace overcomes sin and leads to a life of righteousness. Paul clarifies that everyone is a slave to what they obey. You are either in servitude to sin or to obedience towards righteousness. Through faith, believers have switched allegiances. They no longer serve sin, but God. Thus, a Christian life involves a transformation whereby serving God in righteousness takes precedence, and sin is not just undesirable. It is contrary to the new nature of those in Christ. Paul's rebuttal is clear. Justification by faith is not an invitation to sin, but a charge to pursue holiness. Believers, under grace, are empowered to live lives that reflect their status as redeemed individuals, no longer bound by sin, but dedicated to God and His righteousness. This, Paul posits, is the proper understanding and application of grace. Moreover, Mounts' interpretation of Romans 8, 117 focuses on the profound impact of the Holy Spirit in liberating believers from sin and death. At the heart of this passage is the triumphant assertion that there is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, a statement that marks the transition from a life bound by the law and its consequent guilt 
to one of freedom and spiritual vitality. Mounts elucidates that the believer's freedom is twofold, from the objective condemnation due to sin and from the subjective sense of guilt that haunts many despite their redeemed status. Christ's sacrifice breaks the power of sin and fulfills the law's demands, setting believers free to live according to the Spirit. The Spirit's role is not just to free believers from sin's grip, but also to empower them to fulfill the righteous requirement of the law in their daily lives. The chapter presents two contrasting laws, the law of sin leading to death and the law of the Spirit offering life and peace. Mounts describes the believer's life as a battleground between the old nature, predisposed to sin, and the new nature, influenced by the Spirit. While this conflict persists, the presence of the Spirit ensures that the believer is not left powerless. Victory over sin is not about human effort, but about relying on the Spirit's power. In essence, Mounts portrays Romans 8 as a vibrant exposition of the Christian life, wherein the Spirit's leading is fundamental. To live as a child of God is to be led by the Spirit, continually choosing God's ways over the sinful nature. This dynamic relationship with the Spirit reflects a believer's true identity as a child of God, characterized by a life in step with the Spirit's transformative work. Mounts's interpretation encourages a dependence on the Holy Spirit's guidance as the key to a victorious and fulfilling Christian life. Furthermore, in his commentary on Romans 8, 18, 39, Mounts probes into the theme of suffering and glory in the Christian life. He conveys Paul's acknowledgement that being a Christian does not exempt one from suffering. Indeed, Paul himself endured immense hardships. Yet these present sufferings are minuscule compared to the incomparable future glory awaiting believers. This glory is a restoration of divine radiance lost in the fall a transformation into the image of God as originally intended, which all creation eagerly awaits alongside humanity. Mounts emphasizes two significant sources of support for believers amid their afflictions. Firstly, the Holy Spirit's intercessory role is accentuated. When believers are unsure of what to pray for, the Spirit intercedes with profound earnestness. This divine intercession assures believers that their groanings are understood and acted upon by God. Secondly, the assurance that God orchestrates all things for the good of those who love Him is a source of comfort and strength. This isn't a promise that all circumstances will be favorable, but that their cumulative effect will contribute to the believer's ultimate good and conformity to Christ. The passage culminates in a powerful assertion of the believer's security in God's love, affirming that nothing can sever the bond between God and the believer in Christ. This conviction stems from a reflection on God's unwavering commitment, evidenced by Christ's sacrificial love and the continual presence of the Spirit. Mounts interprets these verses as not just theological statements, but as experiential truths, offering profound hope and encouragement to believers. Through his exposition, Mounts presents Romans 8 as a profound source of comfort and assurance, affirming the transient nature of current afflictions compared to the eternal glory and the steadfast support believers have in God's love. In addition, in Mounts' interpretation of Romans 9, 11, he investigates the Apostle Paul's theological grappling with the fate of Israel in light of the emerging Christian gospel. Mounts elucidates Paul's emotional turmoil over his fellow Jews' rejection of Christ, which serves as a backdrop for exploring the broader implications of God's promises and the true definition of Israel. The distinction between physical descent from Abraham and spiritual lineage becomes paramount, with Paul asserting God's sovereign choice as the basis for belonging to the true Israel, illustrated through the preference of Isaac over Ishmael and Jacob over Esau. Mounts highlights the apostles' preemptive rebuttal to anticipated criticisms regarding the fairness of divine election. God's absolute sovereignty and the right to show mercy to whomever he chooses are defended portraying God as the potter with complete authority over the clay. This perspective extends to the concept of righteousness, contrasting the Jews' failed attempt to establish their own through the law with the righteousness that comes from faith in Christ, accessible to all. The narrative then shifts to the broader redemptive arc, wherein Israel's rejection leads to the salvation of the Gentiles, setting the stage for Israel's eventual collective salvation. This is described as a mystery involving several stages, the hardening of part of Israel, the inclusion of the Gentiles, 
and the ultimate salvation of all Israel. Mounts interprets these chapters as not only a theological discussion on God's fidelity and justice, but also as an exposition of the profound mystery of divine salvation history, culminating in a doxology that marvels at the wisdom and knowledge of God. Through this exposition, Mount sheds light on Paul's complex yet hopeful outlook on the destiny of Israel and the inclusive nature of God's saving grace. Further, in Mount's interpretation of Romans 12, 1, 2, 9, 13, he indicates the shift from theological discourse to practical Christian living, maintaining that the latter is not a return to legalism but an expression of faith. The passage pivots around the concept of presenting oneself as a living sacrifice, a call to a decisive and practical dedication to God, grounded in His mercy and transformative power. This transformation entails a rejection of conforming to worldly patterns and an embrace of a new, spiritually renewed mindset. Mount stresses that the Christian ethic outlined by Paul is rooted in sincerity, love, and active service, propelled by the Holy Spirit's indwelling presence. This lifestyle goes beyond mere adherence to rules. It's an embodiment of grace, marked by genuine love, agape, humility, and a preference for others' needs. He paints a picture of a vibrant, active faith, characterized by zeal and spiritual fervor, where believers are engaged in a dynamic relationship with God, driven by hope and patience even in suffering. Besides, the commentary reflects on the communal aspect of Paul's message, pointing out how Christians are to relate to one another with brotherly love, honor, and hospitality. Mounts interprets these rules not as constraints, but as liberating guidelines that direct believers toward the most fulfilling and God-honoring life. They are not just individual mandates, but collective markers of a community transformed by grace, living out the radical implications of the gospel. In summary, Mounts's exposition of Romans 12 reiterates the integration of belief and behavior in Christian life. It's a call to a holistic, transformative, and active discipleship, centered on a deep-seated response to God's mercy, expressed in sincere love, service, and a commitment to spiritual growth and community building. This section of Romans is not just a moral guide, but a manifesto for a life radically changed by and for the gospel. Additionally, in his analysis of Romans 13, 1 Robert Mounts explores the Christian's duty to governmental authorities and the broader, ever-present obligation to love. He debates against the notion that the opening verses are disjointed from Paul's message, instead presenting them as a continuation of discussions on societal relations within and outside the Christian community. Mount sees the command to respect and obey authorities as rooted in the belief that all authority is divinely instituted. This respect is part of the Christian's debt of love, a debt that is perpetual and never fully repayable. However, he recognizes the moral dilemma posed by tyrannical or unjust rulers, citing historical atrocities as evidence of the complexities in applying this teaching. In such cases, Mount suggests that there is a moral and sometimes necessary place for civil disobedience, as seen in biblical precedents and the principled stands of figures in history like those at the Nuremberg Trials. Central to Mount's exposition is the concept of love as the fulfilling of the law. This love is not an abstract or general sentiment, but a specific, actionable duty towards the other, the person in immediate need. Love, in this sense, is deeply personal and practical, requiring action rather than mere sentiment. Mounts wraps up by discussing the urgency of living a life characterized by love, given the transient nature of life and the impending end of the current age. He echoes Paul's exhortation to live as children of light, embodying the love and character of Jesus Christ. In doing so, Christians are not only adhering to their temporal obligations, but also preparing for the coming age of God's eternal reign. Through a life of love, believers fulfill their deepest moral and spiritual obligations, transforming their lives and the world around them in anticipation of the ultimate fulfillment of God's kingdom. Last but not least, in his commentary on Romans 14, 11513 Mounts delves into the complexities of Christian ethics and communal living, particularly addressing how individuals with varying levels of liberty in their faith should interact, especially in the context of morally neutral issues, termed adiaphora. 
He provides a nuanced discussion of the dynamics between weak and strong believers in the Roman Church, referring primarily to their approaches to Jewish dietary laws and ceremonial practices after converting to Christianity. The weak are those who, while not uncertain of their faith, are hesitant to embrace certain liberties, whereas the strong fully embrace their freedom from the ceremonial aspects of the law due to their understanding of Christ as the fulfillment of the law. Mount stresses the importance of mutual understanding and love within the Christian community. He criticizes the tendency of the weak to judge the strong for their liberties and the propensity of the strong to dismiss the sensitivities of the weak. The emphasis is placed on the community's responsibility to avoid causing one another to stumble and to prioritize love over personal freedom. The responsibilities of the strong are particularly repeated, including bearing with the weaknesses of others, not seeking self-gratification, and striving to uplift and edify others. This conduct reflects a Christ-like selflessness and prioritizes the spiritual welfare of the community over individual rights. Towards the end of his commentary, Mounts calls for unity and mutual acceptance within the Christian community, paralleling Christ's self-sacrificial acceptance of believers. He advocates for a spirit of unity that goes beyond mere tolerance to active, loving acceptance, leading to a vibrant community life marked by joy, peace, and hope. This approach not only addresses the specific issue of dietary laws and ceremonial practices, but also provides a framework for dealing with a variety of ethical and moral issues within the Christian community. In conclusion, Mounts's analysis of the Epistle to the Romans firmly supports Apostle Paul as the authentic author, underlining the letter's self-identification and thematic consistency with Paul's other writings. He discusses the role of Tertius, the scribe, suggesting that Paul's direct influence shaped the letter's content, despite the use of an amanuensis. Mounts disputes for a close transcription role for Tertius, maintaining the integrity of Paul's message. Also, Mounts addresses the recipients of Romans, supporting the traditional view that it was specifically addressed to the Christians in Rome. He negates theories of other foundational figures like Peter, proposing instead an organic development of the church through Jewish and Gentile believers. He situates the letter's composition in Corinth or Cancrea during Paul's third missionary journey, around A.D. 56, using internal and external evidence to pinpoint the timing. Moreover, the commentary underscores Romans as foundational in understanding Paul's theological framework, particularly emphasizing justification by faith. Mounts notes Paul's strategic vision for his mission, with Rome as a crucial base for further westward expansion. The letter's rich theological discussion addresses righteousness, God's wrath, and the transformative power of the gospel, with Paul meticulously clarifying his doctrinal stance. Furthermore, Mounts explores textual debates, including the inclusion and structure of the final chapters, and provides interpretations of key themes like natural revelation, the role of faith, and ethical implications for believers. He accentuates love as the fulfillment of the law, the believer's duty towards government, and the transformative lifestyle advocated by Paul. In essence, Mounts's commentary offers a thorough examination of Romans, combining historical, textual, and doctrinal insights. He provides a nuanced understanding of Paul's most theologically significant letter, affirming its role in articulating foundational Christian beliefs and ethical directives, all while showcasing the Apostles' strategic and doctrinal depth.